Well, this is a particular joy that I have in introducing someone, believe it or not, that I have known for over 50 years. And uh, we live in different parts of the country, don't have regular contact with each other, but it, you, you have no idea what a delight it is to be back in the presence of Dr. Wayne Grudem. And uh, Wayne, just welcome. Here in Arizona, I'm in cold Michigan now these days, but uh, welcome to the, the podcast, Wayne. Well, we consider it cold here too. It's 64 degrees. In oh, South. You, we're just, we, we <laughs> shed big tears for you, my friend. <laughs> It's like 24 degrees and going down a lot of snow, but uh, anyhow, good to talk. Let me tell you a little bit more about Wayne. Um, he is a distinguished research professor of theology and biblical studies at Phoenix Seminary in Arizona. Uh, he graduated from Harvard, Westminster Seminary, and the University of Cambridge, England. So he's done a number of different steps. He has published over 25 books, including Systematic Theology, which is something which I think most uh, uh, theological students, uh, you know, those pursuing the ministry, have seen this huge book. It's an amazing book. And also Politics According to the Bible. That sounds like an interesting combination. And a past president of the Evangelical Theological Society and general editor of a Bible that I read all the time, the ESV study Bible. And uh, so amazing things that you have done, Wayne. So proud of you and thankful for all you've done. So again, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you, Randy. It's good to be with you and to see you again. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's been I want to give, want to yeah. give the honor to the Lord for enabling me to work on those projects. Uh, I, I totally get it. Yeah. You were at Harvard, I was at MIT, and yeah. uh, we went to, together to Park Street Congregational Church, uh, the uh, Collegiate Club, or whatever they called it there at the time, and uh, got involved in InterVarsity and Campus Crusade and other sorts of ministries, but just I've been following you from a distance and just, again, so proud of how God has worked through you, and you have just courageously stepped up to the plate, so again. So, so thankful. Thanks for being on this podcast. You're welcome. Good to be with you. Now, you know, Wayne, that the, the general theme of, uh, of this podcast is, you know, what is God saying to the American church today? And I know you've given a lot of thought to that. And uh, uh, what, what, how, would you, how would you approach that? What, what do you sense that if, if God could speak to <laughs> the leaders of the American church today, and even the followers, what would he want to say to us? Well, I have the answer. Okay. There it is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right there. It's all right there. Yeah. I thought of various themes, Randy, when you said, uh, what is God saying to the American church? And it's no one thing. It's... Um, a message of comfort for our friends who uh, the, the husband's mother is in hospice now in her last days mm -hmm. saying another thing to our son Alexander with his little our little granddaughter Maggie who's 20 months old mm -hmm. saying something else to the new pastor at their church saying something else to mm -hmm. neighbors in need uh, there's guidance in scripture. It, all scripture is breathed out by God and mm -hmm. profitable for doctrine, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. And so I read Psalm 116 this morning and Revelation uh, chapter 14, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm working through the New Testament, through the Old Testament. And God speaks to me through those words Yes. every day. Me too. Yes. So... Um, I think I would just encourage Christians in the United States, thinking about the United States in particular, mm -hmm. uh, to maintain a regular habit of Bible reading and prayer, to keep their relationship with God fresh and new and real. Yeah. Um, and then uh, he'll guide us in the things we should do. That's good. I, I totally agree. And I, 
I'm in the Bible every day. I've, I've read through the whole Bible every year for the last number of years. A uh, couple chapters in the old, one in the new, and then I bring in Proverbs and Psalms and Proverbs uh, in the middle of it often. And uh, God always, I mean, it's funny, isn't it amazing how you could read the same thing that you have read hundreds of times and yeah. God will give you a new message from the same words for yeah. that particular day. Isn't that amazing how the yeah. Holy Spirit yeah. does that? That is so cool. I love that. Having said that, Wayne, and I totally agree with where, where you're going with that, is that God has a unique message for each individual. But, you know, you think, you, 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 you read through Revelation again, you know, Revelation 2 and 3, he speaks to the churches of yes. various cities, and he's got a message, like to Laodicea. It's, it's amazing the number of people that I have interviewed on this podcast bring up that particular message to the church of Laodicea, in Revelation 3 as, as a pretty much a parallel to maybe what God would want to say to the church in America today. What, what, what do you think of that? You say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Yeah, in other words, they thought they were rich in need of nothing. He yeah. says, nope, you're lukewarm. You're uh, those four, five adjectives you describe, wretched, poor, pitiable, blind, naked. And, uh, <laughs> but then he says, those whom I love, he loves yeah. them. It's not that he hates them. And he yeah. says, I'm, I'm knocking at the door. I want to come in, yeah. not, to, not to yell at you, but I want to fellowship with you. All right. I mean, my sense is that that that's that's been the American. I mean, the church in China, the church in Iran, the church in Afghanistan and North Korea. Despite persecution, they've been on a growth spurt. Yeah. The church in America, not so much. Why is that, Wayne? It depends on how you count. Um, I've traveled various parts of the United States and speak, I've spoken in various meetings and conferences. Mm -hmm. And just about any place you go, you'll find a strong growing church or more in every city where the Bible is being taught and people are seeking daily to follow the Lord. I'm more encouraged than some people are. That's great. I'm so glad to hear that. Please give me more. <laughs> uh, Randy, throw a dart at a map of the United States and wherever we go, we'll find or you look on the internet for, for that town, you'll find there's a Bible-believing church. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's growing, and they're having children. They're coming up, growing up in the education program of the church, and there's an outreach. Mm -hmm. So liberal churches that don't believe the Bible are declining rapidly in membership, but if you count them, that it's not really counting the Lord's people. That's true. That's good. I like that. Well, that's encouraging. And Randy, um, I remember a meeting where I was the main speaker of the Evangelical Theological Society, the um, professional society for professors who teach Bible and theology in the United States and Canada. Okay. 1986, there were 350 people there. This year, we had 2,600. Wow. When I went to seminary, when you and I were in college, and then I was thinking where to go to seminary, if I look back now historically, I think there are maybe six or seven seminaries in the United States where I could recommend, if I knew what I know now back then, Okay. I could recommend people to go to. Now I think there are 17. Okay. Wow. So there's, there's encouragement, and the, there's more solid Bible-believing, Bible-faithful Christian literature published now in the United States, then, well, in the English speaking world, because the UK publishes some in Australia and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, more uh, solid Bible faithful books published than have ever been published before in any nation, mm -hmm. any language, any culture <laughs> in history. So the resources are there, and um, evangelical seminaries that believe the Bible are strong. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hopeful that we may be on a preparation route for revival. 
Why we need it. Now, you and I were, again, in Boston in the 1960s. Yeah. And uh, there was the Jesus movement, they now describe it, right? Yes. They'd happened, uh, you know, the late 60s, early 70s. Do you remember when Francis Schaeffer came to town? I do. I drove him in my car. Did you? Uh, yeah. Well, I never had that close a relationship, but boy, he sure impacted me. Seriously, if, if you had asked me before Francis Schaefer came to town why I should become a Christian or someone should become a Christian, I'd say, well, it's going to make you feel good. Uh, and remember what he'd say about that? He said, you want to feel good, take drugs. <laughs> but he said, it's true truth. Yes. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, that just was, that, that was life changing for me. You know, the resurrection actually happened yes. in time and space, you know, that, that, uh, that what we're talking about is not just a nice feeling, but it's true truth, as Jaffer would say. But we're back in a time, though, where younger people, uh, and, and, and some people in the church at least, just say, well, I just feel. Uh, that I'm, you know, kind of half male and half female, or I feel this or feel that, and we let feelings trump um, truth. So yes. Where, where do you go with that? I, my, in, my first instinct is to say the Bible has power to speak to people's hearts and minds. Mm. And it it begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yep. Starts out telling who God is and where we came from. And uh, Paul, in Acts 17, when he's speaking to the philosophers in Athens, who had no significant background in Jewish religion or anything That's like true. it. Yep. He said, uh, the God who made the world and everything in it has set a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness mm -hmm. by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given testimony by raising him from the dead. Um, hmm. So God is the creator. He's this, he speaks truth in his word. And there's a judgment coming where all people will be held accountable. And in spite of the fact that people say, well, I don't feel good about that. There is a witness of conscience that's deep in people's hearts. Hmm. Uh, and there's maybe not a solid conviction that there will be a final judgment but uh, at least a vague sense that there will be an accountability for people after this, this life is over hmm. and the, the proclamation of the bible is that that is clarified where paul says god has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed i remember visiting our, when we lived in illinois visiting our congressman and um we got into a dialogue about abortion okay. first, first in, in his town hall meeting, and then personal correspondence afterward. Finally, he invited me to come to his office. Okay. What started was a, a question to him, Congressman, when you stand before God at final judgment, what will you say to him about how you voted on abortion legislation? <laughs> he, was, he was struck silent for a moment, and then he gave me a fairly decent answer huh. uh, but it led to a long conversation and god is putting people's hearts and minds an awareness that he exists and he holds people accountable much as they try to suppress that and deny it it's there it's witness of conscience that can't be erased why i love that so preaching the word of god the word of god has power doesn't it it does. And the, I mean, the Holy Spirit, it's the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. So that, that would be a recommendation is that we, you held the Bible up. That was good. But uh, preach it, right? Get it, get it going. And it has power to divide, yeah. you know, get to, it's, it's the double-edged sword, isn't it? So that, look, that, was, that was Billy Graham's whole ministry. That's true. That's true. Boy, that is good. Well, you mentioned talking to a congressman. Well, let's get into the, the issue of Christians getting involved in politics. Well, what, what's, I mean, some, you know, there's two sides to that. One is, okay, we got to build a theocracy, right? 
God, you know, just get back to, you know, kind of a theocratic sort of a thing. And the other extreme is, oh, no, don't mix church and politics for crying out loud. We right. can't do that. So where do you stand on that, Wayne? Let me grab this book. I'm going to promote this just a little bit. Politics According to the Bible. Okay. And yeah. it's published there in Grand Rapids by Zondervan. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, so, so summarize that, that great well, book. Uh, there are five wrong views of Christians in government. One is that uh, Christians should, one is that the uh, church should rule the government. And yeah. that's wrong. And the yeah. next is that the government should rule the church, and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, we, in respect to that, we argue for religious freedom because you can't, oh, the first, uh, let me rephrase that. The first mistake is that government should compel religion. And that's a mistake because you can't force other people to believe. Believing in Christ is a, is a you can't even force your children to believe. That's true. So the government can't force people to believe successfully. Right. So it's a voluntary choice. And the other is government should exclude religion. That's mm. take religion out of the public square and let it be private inside your house and inside your church only. Right. Yep. And that's uh, that's communist China. That's North Korea. And it's you know, contrary to the, the First Amendment of the Constitution. Congress should right. make no law respecting the establishment of religion. They shouldn't establish it. Nor the there nor to prohibit the free exercise thereof. Right. So, yeah. That's a wonderful amendment. It's protected it us from religious persecution. Yes. The third mistake is government is evil and Christians should stay out of it. Hmm. And there are some like Mennonites and others, I believe, that exactly that have yeah. that attitude is ooh, stay yeah. away. Minnesota pastor Greg Boyd, the myth of a Christian nation, argues that way. Oh, okay. But I don't think that's right either, because government is, according to Romans 13, God's servant for our good. And, and here in America, it's like we're shareholders. We're, we're part owners. It's government of the people, by the people, for the people. Yeah, that's an amazingly helpful. We're going we're gonna to answer to God, I think, for our stewardship right. or lack thereof, of that which we own. The fourth mistake is... Um, Preach the gospel and don't get involved in politics. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of that going on right now. Right, that's very common. Yes. But the Bible is full of teaching about government. Good and evil kings in the Old Testament, Psalms and Proverbs have a lot of statements about wise rulers and foolish. Yes, true. Or evil ones. Yep. And uh, Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 talk about the responsibilities of civil government. That's totally true. Uh, so if we're going to teach the whole counsel of God, all that is in his word, we need to speak and teach about government policies. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote this book on politics and the Bible. Yeah, that's good. Um, so so uh, preach the gospel and don't do politics is the fourth mistake. Fifth mistake is do politics and not uh, not preach the gospel. That's the social just the social uh, social gospel movement in the early twentieth century. That that what is again? Repeat that for me, if you would. Um, or elaborate do, on it. Christians should um, influence government, but not preach the gospel. Mm. Hmm. that's just try to overcome homelessness and okay drug addiction and just do nice things but right. don't preach the gospel and let people even though they're comfortable on this side of eternity they'll they'll burn in hell if they don't accept christ as their savior and Lord. right so that's a mistake so the right approach i think is significant christian influence on government significant christian influence on government significant okay. right now that's not compelling religion but it's not prohibiting religion either. It's saying right. we have convictions, we have teachings from God himself and his word about the nature of 
humanity, the nature of government, the yep. responsibilities of government, and moral right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And we should have the freedom to express those view viewpoints in the public square. Right. No, I agree with that. It, and, you know, the, the remember Ted Koppel? Yes. Nightline? He spoke, he gave a graduation talk at, uh, I think it was Duke University. I could be wrong in that, but I think it was Duke. It was a number of years ago. And he said the Ten Commandments are, or what Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> and, you know, the, the reality is, you know, like there's a law of gravity, but God has also, you know, put moral laws into the universe that we violate to our peril. Right. And it's loving for us to communicate these and get them, get our laws to reflect them. All law, again, you know my background, I was a prosecutor and a judge. Um, so I've had a little bit of background in the area of, of government. Um, but yeah. all, all laws are a reflection of a moral system of what's right and wrong. All yes. laws are. And that, in turn, is a reflection of the worldview that undergirds those, those moral laws and principles. And the question is, what, what uh, worldview is going to be the underpinning for our legal system and, and governmental system in, in America? Right. Traditionally, it's it's been the Judeo-Christian yeah. tradition. But, yes, with the yeah, result of the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, which yes. respect biblical values throughout yeah. both documents. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's been an amazing event in world history to have the United States founded on such mm -hmm. wisdom. That's right. Um, derived ultimately from scriptural teaching. That's it. In, in most cases. And again, there will be the voices from the other side, the progressive side, that will say, oh, you can't mix religion and government, you know? We just base it all on science or feelings or freedom. So we should defund the police. Just let people do what they want to do and, and everything will be fine. Well, what's wrong with that thinking, Wayne? <laughs> well, um... First Peter two says that the civil authority is to praise those who do good and punish those who do wrong or do evil. Yeah. And uh, Romans four, Romans thirteen four says that the civil authority mm -hmm. is God's servant to execute His wrath on the wrongdoer. Yes. So government is given by God the right to use force mm -hmm. to overcome evil or to restrain yep. evil. Yeah. And to punish it and. Yep. Uh, Mm -hmm. the, I'm afraid that the progressive political uh, group is unwilling to acknowledge that there are some people in the world who are just evil. That's true. And they cannot be restrained by conversation or negotiation or further handouts. Yep. Uh, they can only be restrained by su superior force. That's it. Yeah, I actually, when I was at MIT, I learned a, a, a way to design uh, computer systems and, and uh, analyses that are based on a kind of a, a computer uh, algorithm and so on. And I used that in law school to develop a, a, a program that said, how can we reduce crime? And you know, the, the answer, it, it's basically Ecclesiastes 8.11. Can you quote that for me? <laughs> is it one sentence again you you got it you, you are you are a walking bible when, when, no. <laughs> when sentence this. against an evil deed is not executed speedily the heart of the sons of men is wholly set to do evil that's it certainty of punishment if you don't punish those that you do manage to catch and convict and it's a small percentage of the total crime rate but it provides a deterrent to those that are thinking about breaking the law right and that's again, that's in scripture. You're amazing. You you know the Bible pretty good, don't you? <laughs> well, I know some of it. Yeah, that's <laughs> incredible. Uh, that's so good. Well, what else do you want to add about our country and where it's heading and 
and whether we're going to see revival coming in the, hopefully the near future. Uh, given, well, Randy, there's something else going on. Um, that is, around the world, the church has grown remarkably in certain areas. In Africa, Asia, and Latin America, there have been revivals in country after country. And millions of people have become genuine born-again Christians. Yes. It has not yet happened in Western Europe or uh, the United States, North America. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that God will not pass us by. A lot of people quote Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Yeah. Do you go there as well, as far as what is needed to get to the revival? I'm not sure, Randy. I've thought about it. if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. I'm not sure I'm going to get it all. Humble themselves and, and pray. Turn and from their evil ways and seek seek pray. His face. Seek His face. Four things. Humble themselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then he'll yeah, hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and, and heal them. Yeah. I don't think it's the sins of born again Christians that are the reason God is withholding revival from us. That is, the people that we know, Margaret and I know in our church, for instance, or our home fellowship group, they're not perfect, but sinner is not the first adjective that comes to mind when I think about them. Hmm. Um, so I realize that the, uh, the evils of breaking all, many of the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness, there's the falsehood. Mm -hmm being propagated by people repeatedly throughout the day. And mm -hmm. honor your father and your mother, that's not being followed many times. And mm -hmm. you shall not murder. Well, the abortion industry continues to take innocent life. Yeah. And you shall not commit adultery, but the pornography industry is thriving. And there's marital unfaithfulness glorified in the media and entertainment world. And you shall not steal. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a disregard for property rights. But those things, there's rampant disobedience to God, God's moral standards. And I think homosexuality and transgenderism are other signs of that. Right. So there's much wrong being done in our nation. But, and I'm not saying that people who would, attend Bible-believing churches are innocent, but they're not primarily promoting those lifestyles that are contrary to God's moral standards. Hmm. So is it is God waiting for a repentance from his people who believe his word and are praying and seeking to follow him each day? It should be, it should be, well, I'd say the sins that I know in my own life and that others close to me would say are in their lives, they're primarily sins of attitude and mm -hmm. sins of the heart. I, I agree with that. Um, so the, if the, the mm -hmm. spirit of God moves wonderfully in our midst, there'll no doubt, no doubt be repentance for careless words we've spoken mm -hmm. and for wrongful attitudes and for failure to love as we ought. But I see a genuine desire to follow God, believe what his word says, be obedient to it. So I'm, I'm just thinking with you out loud as we talk. Yeah, no, I hear you. Talk. Uh -huh. I, I run into a, a lot of Christians. Uh, Marcia, my wife, Marcia, is an evangelist, so she's talking to people a lot. And she finds many young people, especially Christians, uh, they're really born again. They've asked Christ to forgive their sins, come into their life, but they're living together, husband, man yeah. and woman, without yeah. being married. Yeah. There's a lot of divorce in the church. Um, you know, and, and I think there's been a lot of, and I can speak you know, personally, it just, hey, I'm entitled to, I deserve my freedom, my 
my luxury, my, my stuff, um, rather than really like Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. He would save his life, will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will save. To really be all in, like some of our brothers and sisters in China, for example, in Iran, yeah. where they really have to be willing to die, uh, certainly be incarcerated or whatever. And I just don't know if we're there. I remember, we're, you probably didn't attend, but Richard Vermbrand came to Boston. In fact, he came to MIT's chapel when I was either a freshman or sophomore. You didn't hear I think that. he spoke at Park Street Church also. Oh, did he? Okay, well, I forget that. But I do remember him coming and remember what he said. He took his shirt off. And he probably didn't do that at Park Street Church, but he took his shirt off at our little chapel at MIT. And he had all these holes punched through them. I mean, from where they had taken these red hot pokers and you know, really tortured them in Romania. And I never forget what he said. He said, he said, in, in Romania, we have one kind of Christian, a Christ-like Christian. In America, you have lots of kinds of Christians. And I think that's a fair statement, Wayne. I think we've got a lot of ambivalence on the part of Christians. Yeah. Those, the ones that I run into, I, mean, I love them. They're in, you know, many of them, we got a lot of people that don't, they're not really reading their Bible on a regular basis. I think that's fair to say. And prayers are just kind of, you know, bless me, help me, keep me, whatever. Amen. And let's get off to the more important yeah. stuff. So I think I, I push back on you a little bit on that one, my brother. I think, I, mean, I, think, I think Christians in America are not, not all in like we need to be. And I think that's why we're experiencing the COVID thing and pressure by our culture to get us to be all in like Jesus was all in for you and me. I hear what you say. I'm, I can't disagree. I, the examples you point out are genuine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But I'm, part of it is the protections we have <clears throat> with our constitution, freedom mm -hmm. of religion. Yes. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I mean, it's not as hard for us as it is for yep. Christians in hostile countries. Yep, and again, we're running a little uh, lengthy here and, and I don't wanna get way down this road, but even the issue of abortion, um, you know, God convicted Marsha and me many years ago. Um, really, the connection between what we were doing in our marriage and the abortion issue. That is, you know, physical relationships between husband and wife, that's a priority, but giving birth to a child, not so important. You know, we're, we don't have the money, we don't have the time. And, uh, and what, what are people that have abortions? They, they really they have the same mentality, the same motive, and the same result, that is, no child is born alive, a different means. And I don't want to go too far down this road, but again, the book that I wrote on that subject, um, uh, you know, Deeper, uh, Sweeter, no, Sweeter by the Dozen. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, talks about that connection. And it's kind of interesting how also the population issue, and again, I don't want to take all the time to do that. But uh, the, the aging of our population, uh, the, the insufficient numbers of people being born, children being born to ultimately be in the workforce to pay for the medical care of the older folks. In China, they used to have this one child per family policy. I right. haven't seen that recently. I mean, they're, they're now up to three and they're, they're having trouble getting people having kids because they see yeah. demographically they're in, they're in big trouble. Like Japan is way ahead in that uh problem so anyhow i don't want to go too far down there but i think i think there's room for american christians to to be more all in than we have been and that's starting with with this guy okay just to be honest with you and uh and so that's really part of the reason why we're doing this this podcast to be to be very blunt so any other final comments otherwise i'd love to ask you to close us in prayer brother well let's see there's always room for growth in holiness yes. of life. Yes. And growth in commitment and deeper and growth in faith. Amen. Um, so I agree with you on that. I and, appreciate it. Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Wayne.
Um, I think that's that's all I'll say at this point. All right. Well, uh, there's you're you're a you're a wealth of knowledge and background, and I just I love you, brother, and so proud of you, and so thankful for who you are and, and all you have contributed to the the cause of of Jesus in this world. So thank you. Thankful for you, Randy. Good so to be connecting. Why don't you close us in prayer, would you, brother? Okay. Lord Jesus, we hear your promise that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Mm. And we see you growing your church around the world. And we ask, Lord, that you would not pass us by. Yes. Here in this country that we love. Lord, that you would give us better leaders. That you would give us leaders who have hearts of faithfulness and devotion to you and walk in your paths and your ways. And even leaders who don't know you but have, have moral convictions that are similar to what your word says. Lord, we'll take will support those who will lead our country to better standards. We pray for widespread repentance from sin, conviction of sin, knowledge of your holiness and what you require of us. But we ask that you would spread throughout our nation uh, a fear of final judgment. Yes. We know that your word says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hmm. And that fear, Lord, we pray that it would ignite uh, turning to you and uh, crying out for mercy hmm. on the part of people who don't know you. Lord, guide Randy in this broadcast and give him effectiveness in advancing the teaching of your word and the work of your kingdom here on earth. Hmm. Protect us, Lord, from straying from you. Keep us faithful to you through our lives. Hmm. And Lord, if, there's, if there are areas where you want us to change our conduct, our actions, our behavior, our thoughts. We pray that you'd show us that in your word. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this time together. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Thanks again. <laughs>